This is Deborah Atkinson, and you're listening to the Voice for Fitness Professionals podcast, where I address the marketing and the sales tips for trainers who want to attract, keep, and help more clients easily without the sleaze. So today, I want to talk about how do you sell more fitness consultations. So the real meaning of that is how do you get more consultations booked, step one, and step two from that, how do you come out of those meetings with more clients, a new customer? And this time of year, that's never more popular of a conversation because we're all entering the end of the year rush, the thinking, the planning for your next year. And we know that in January, we're going to have people fall in our lap. But if this is a good time to market, you know, we naturally have people falling in our lap. If you market correctly, you could probably double that number as opposed to just letting come to you what will come to you. So here's something to keep in mind. And I'm talking right now about some research that was dedicated to doctors looking at medical practitioners. When a provider, a doctor, showed competence, whether that was through familiarity with a treatment, they were more warm, they were understanding of a patient's needs, values, and goals, they did better. The patient did better with whatever the treatment was. When the patient perceived the practitioner as maybe incompetent or less competent, less credentialed, less qualified, they got lesser results. So if we could extrapolate that, what does that look like for a fitness professional whose clients need to get results? So the number one, they stay. They continue to buy more sessions. Number two, they... It, well, and not to overlook zero, right? Over getting results in the first place so that we change lives. Not overlooking that. But number two, we want them to continue to do some training to maybe change from the weight loss to, you know, fitting into exercise pants to actually changing their life so they're experiencing it. And then, you know, how do we get them to tell everybody else about it based on the results they have just from walking around, people will ask and they'll be telling it. They'll be telling people about you because you've helped them. How do we make that work? So here's here's an idea. In the study where they actually set it up so that there were doctors who were dressed very appropriately in a lab coat, they from start to end were much warmer. They took a little bit more time and asked about where they were from, where they were raised, what it was like to grow up there. And they also did their job very effectively and efficiently. So if they were putting on a blood pressure cuff or listening to the heartbeat, they did it with confidence, expertise, no fumbling. And then they made some of the other practitioners, so realize this is a study, they made them fumble a little bit. And they made them fumble with the blood pressure cuff so it didn't quite go right or the stethoscope kind of slipped and um, dropped out of their hand or dropped out of their ear. They, they may have had a lab coat on, but it actually said, you know, um, student doctor <laughs> or resident, you know, doctor, new, under training, that kind of thing. So, you know, I mean, imagine if, you, if your name tag said intern versus personal trainer, I mean, how would that affect the way people perceive you? You get the idea, right? So um, the admission of never having worked with a client with this certain challenge before, have you ever had to say that? You know, no, I've never worked with a, a client who has osteoporosis before because we've all, all had that first time, right? Or you're using a soft, timid voice. You're hiring maybe a staff member who you know. That's what they're doing. You're hiring a staff member who's maybe young and in her 20s, and she's working with women in their 50s and 60s who've been around the block. They've had a nutritionist before. They are CEOs. They've sold. They've marketed. They've stood in the front of the room. 
and led people or spoken to groups. And here they have an introverted, quiet, young person who they may perceive as you know, not necessarily being able to take care of them. In fact, they may feel like, you know, they're parenting or let you're so much like my daughter that, you know, this isn't going to work. So a couple of tips for you as a personal trainer. So don't get down on yourself if you are young, if you are, you know, cute, right? Or you're very attractive or you're male. I'm going to address right here what happens with midlife women because those are very likely 80% of the people walking through your doors and or they influence 80% of the people walking through your doors. A woman is responsible for 80% of all household decisions. And that means if her kids are going to have a membership at the gym or if they're going to do sports enhancement training, or if her spouse is going to take up personal training or is encouraged to Go, get out of the house, do some exercise, lose a little bit of weight, want you healthier. It may be due to her. So she's really important to you. So how do you overcome the obstacle of an age gap and a life experience gap? You may have a great education, you may have certifications, but if you don't have a lot of experience and you don't have a lot of life experience. It may be harder for you to relate. That doesn't mean it's impossible. So if you're young, number one, dress older, dress professionally. You're going to have to work harder at it than someone who, for instance, is, I'm 53. So I can relate because I am that midlife woman, right? And I know not only the education, the certification, the studies, the research, the protocols, but I know the life experience that she's potentially been through. Married, had kids, started a career one direction, maybe went another direction, starting over, divorce. I recognize those. Lost loved ones. I recognize all of those because I too believe them. If you haven't, just realize you need to have some awareness of that and maybe talk to other family members, other people that you know who have been through those things to gain some understanding, to accelerate where you're at. But you need to present yourself. Appearance is one of the number one decision makers or breakers in someone choosing a personal trainer. And I'm going to say more about that. But if you're young, number one, dress older, dress professionally. That has a wide continuum of meaning to a lot of people. But I'm going to drop it right there and let you interpret that. Practice a strong, solid handshake. Practice using a customer's name. If you're not used to doing that in conversation, it will feel awkward at first. But there supposedly is nothing sweeter to a person's ear than hearing their own name. Practice using eye contact. That can be hard for some of us. Tell a customer exactly what you're going to do when you meet them. If you're doing a consultation, tell them exactly what to expect. Here's what's going to happen. You put them at ease by doing that. You also take control. You express authority and credibility that they need to have you have, that you're taking charge. Put them at ease. They don't have to be on. Ask if they have any questions. Then do it. Do the consultation. Then summarize what you did. Ask again if they have any questions. That is taking charge. Now, some of us will be reluctant to ask if they have questions. Afraid, maybe we don't have all the answers. But realize this for a midlife woman. She's finally to the point where she realizes we never have all the answers. So it is okay if you say and may actually elevate you and your status to her. If you can say, you know what? That is a great question, and I don't have the answer to that, but let me check on it, and I'll get back to you. And then do, and you will have elevated yourself in her eyes. Let's address another one. If you're in perfect shape, and, you know, I'm going to play on the other one as well if you're not in perfect shape, but I'm going to start with this one. If you're in perfect shape, you're really proud of your body, don't reveal everything. Be tasteful, not provocative. 
a woman, midlife woman who's in front of you should feel better about herself, not worse when she looks at you and when she leaves you. If you emphasize on your body everything she hates about hers, then there's going to be a disconnect. Never forget that you're a practitioner. You're not on stage. You're not trying out for votes and and judges, right, are not looking at you. She wants to feel like she can walk beside you, not walk behind you or be looking at you on stage because you're so different. I mean, ultimately, as personal trainer, you are selling yourself and someone will buy you who thinks or who has the desire to be you. I mean, that is the reality. So we've got to drop some ego because they actually want to be you. And you have to make it possible for them to think that's possible for them or probable for them. So you cannot be, you know, in a too tightly fitting clothing. You cannot be in too revealing of clothing. But we're going to come back to the opposite. So let's say if you're bigger, right? So size does not matter. How about that? (laughs) Take that any way you want to. Size does not matter as much. Most women, midlife women who were polled about the choice of their personal trainer, wanted to know that their trainer was fit, agile, but not necessarily did she have to be thin or skinny or, or look like a figure competitor. So there might be some skepticism about someone who is not walking the talk, who does not look fit. So if you are an overweight trainer, and then this is a sensitive topic, you can show that you are fit and that you are on the path. I hired, this has probably been eight to 10 years ago, I hired a personal trainer who was uh, a nurse um, prior to becoming a personal trainer. And, you know, she was fairly new, but she had lost 85 to 100 pounds and she was on a journey. Now, she still had significant amount of weight to lose. So coming into our business, there was some pushback by by our members, not necessarily even personal training clients, but there was some pushback about, you know, she doesn't even look the part. She's overweight. So how could you possibly hire somebody to work like that who can't keep herself in shape? You know, and my take on it was her her knowledge, her credibility, her heart, her desire to help. And she was walking the talk and probably could identify with a certain population that, you know, a lean and active and fit all your life trainer could not. So, you know, realize you're going to have all kinds out there judging you, whether it's for better or for worse, whether you're in great shape or you're not in great shape, but there is somebody there that you can relate to. The biggest key is tell your story. So probably the mistake I made now, looking back, hindsight is always so good, is not introducing her and telling her story immediately when she came in, you know, which might have felt a little vulnerable to her, but doing a a video with her, telling her story, telling how much weight she's lost, talking about how she's done it healthfully, and talking about, you know, where she is now, how that feels, the difference in her mindset and personality, and, you know, writing about it. So making sure that in every possible way it was out there and then people can take it or leave it. They can like it or not, but the story and the connectivity that she would have with the right people would probably have been setting her up a little bit better. So, you know, if you've got someone like that on your staff or right now, that's you tell your story. People want to know where you are, what you struggle with, what makes you real and approachable and how you're overcoming it. Important. So let's talk about this. If you're big and you're male, and maybe even if you're only male, but if you're big, you've got great muscles, downplay. Downplay. I mean, wear shirts that fit or size up, not smaller. You cannot come in in clothes that look like they came from Baby Gap, right? 
too tight for a man or a woman, too revealing for a woman, they all impact your first impression. And no matter where you are, you know, maybe in Miami in South Beach, that flies, but almost anywhere else in the country, more people than not who are in need of a personal trainer are intimidated by the gym atmosphere. They don't need to be intimidated by the trainer. So important for you to think about that. Now, I want to hit the flip side as well. Baggy, loose, sloppy clothing, certainly dirty. That should go without saying, but I'm going to have to say it. If you're wearing so many layers that no one can see your form, that's it's equally as negative for customers. Women are definitely much more harsh judges than male clients. And it's interpreted as unprofessional and it's interpreted as a lack of confidence. You are perceived as less successful, less competent, as well as less confident. So you've got to play that sweet spot of not too provocative, not too revealing, and not too baggy, too loose, or too many layers. You know, if you look like you've got three jackets and sweatshirts on, something's wrong, right? I mean, they're going to wonder why, what, what's going on? And you may be cold. Gyms can be that way for trainers who are in the environment but not actually working out. But it's important that you figure out a way to kind of get around that with some thinner layers. This is 2017 after all. Okay, so more provocative is seen as less professional, less experienced, and less credible. This is according to women in their midlife who are choosing trainers. If you come across as cute, trying hard for attention, meaning you are always dressed in super tight, super bright, super look at me, look at me kind of clothes, you will lose authority and credibility or never gain it in the first place. So unprofessional and unethical are two negative reasons in the trainer selection process for a midlife woman why a customer won't hire you. And if you're wearing provocative clothing, that is seen as as unethical as touching inappropriately or saying something using terminology that's inappropriate. So I wouldn't even say that here. It's not necessarily a family show, but I think you know addressing body parts by terms that are unnecessary. What about choosing a female trainer versus a male trainer? This comes up so often. So for midlife women, really it's a toss up. I used to have this happen where females used to come in occasionally and ask, but not firmly. They would ask for a female trainer thinking a female trainer would get them. So there's a small contingency of clients or prospects, customers who will come in and ask for a female trainer thinking they'll get them a little bit better. They'll empathize with them a little bit better. But yeah, if you are young, significantly younger than your training client, it may not matter. And if there's not an older adult of choice, it may not matter at all. It doesn't really matter to most. I was always able to overcome that by saying, you know, we have some male trainers who are available and that this trainer would be my first pick for you based on experience and knowledge and based on personality and the rapport that he's able to create. And I would sell it in a way that I think I actually said these words that many of our male trainers are here because they care and they're here because they want to help. They have a helping personality and they probably have more feminine traits in wanting to serve and care than, than you might be used to or that you might expect. So if you'll try this trainer you know, I'm confident that this is going to be the best trainer for you. And if you are unhappy or dissatisfied, I will make it right. And we will make sure we match you with another trainer as soon as possible. Never once did that happen. Never. So, um, important that you back up what you're doing. It's like, we have a money back guarantee and that wasn't it, but it was a satisfaction guarantee. We were going to make sure somebody was with the right person. 
So there is that small contingency of women that will pick a woman because they believe she'll empathize more with what's going on for her. But another small contingency will choose a male instead because they're afraid of feeling a competitive feeling between the trainer and herself. So whether that's, you know, she doesn't want to compare herself to the trainer and doesn't quite feel she's at the trainer or it's more of an attention thing. Um, whatever that is, just know that that's out there and probably creates a situation where we've got to have good boundaries in place. But right here is a good place to share a really shameless plug for me. So think of this as the, the in the middle infomercial from me. I want to share a, a little plug about a new course that's coming up for personal trainers who want to work with midlife women or who are already working with them and can't seem to get results using the same techniques and strategies that work for most of their other clients. Maybe you can't get a midlife woman to stay long term and this course is for you if that's true. So this is definitely an underserved market that they feel that nobody gets them. They're going through hormone change and probably perimenopause, menopause or beyond when you know, you don't just get to the other side and no longer is hormone come into play. It, they are changed for life. So they change the rules for the rest of your life. So if you have what may be a figure competitor's body perceived as unattainable by the women who wants to, you know, exercise three times a week and have a life, you know, then this is for you so that you can understand what are their needs, what's realistic for them, and, you know, what do they hate, you know, about being tied to the gym or being thinking that they have to exercise for hours a week or hours at a time even and be at the gym every day. This is for you if that's your thought process. So in the selection process, your physique is very important. But the result of others, the result you have gotten others, which is a great reason to get those testimonials, is even more important. So it's more important than your credentials, your degree, your certifications, even your experience. So you can say you've had 30 years of experience, but if you have not changed anybody's life or shape, you may not still get the clients. So before you talk about your degree certifications, before you put that alphabet soup behind your name, be sure that you talk about a successful track record, who you've helped, how you've helped them. And video testimonies will go much further faster than any written testimony that, you know, if somebody is suspicious today in 2017 that you and I wrote those, right, ourselves and just added a name and an age to it. So unless you accompany those by an image, like a headshot, head and shoulder shot, it doesn't have to be a revealing shot, but a full name and age. So you actually have a real person there and it needs to be like the prospect. So obviously if you're talking about speed and agility that you do for youth programming, but you're talking to say a woman in her fifties who might want some running training conditioning, she doesn't want to hear about you know, that kid who got off the bench in high school, she wants to hear about other women in their 50s who you've helped get better at running or improve their gait or comfort or speed. And that's important. So if you deal or work with a wide variety of clients, you need an arsenal of, you know, youth, older adults and special conditions and video, 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 if possible and offer to do it rather than ask them to do it in your last session. Offer to do it. Say, could I, you know, on my phone, ask you a couple of questions and have you respond. You asking the questions gets the response you want. So what instills confidence besides your clothing, your, your direct appearance? It's familiarity, right? Knowing what it is that you're doing is hugely important. So you have to be familiar with, feel good about, look like you know what you're doing when you're in a sales situation, when you're in a 
maybe a, a room and meet and greet, right, at a chamber of commerce event, when you are doing a consultation with a client for the first time, body composition, testing, and interpreting. So these things take practice. They don't just happen automatically. When you're training a specific population, you're training a specific condition, when you're using a specific piece of equipment, or let's say you're brand new in a gym. This one always intimidates me, and I've been in the industry for 34 years. I met a client last week for the first time at a new facility. I had worked with this client previously, but at another facility that I was very comfortable with and used myself. She wanted to meet at a rec center. I had never been in. So I showed up an hour early to walk around, get a handle on where all the equipment was, what the equipment was, move the equipment myself, actually get on and off and use it myself to get a feel for where would be the best place for us to talk, where was quiet, where was loud, where I wanted her to exercise in what little piece of this huge monstrosity of a rec center. And, you know, that is something that you're going to have to do each and every time. If you're doing fitness testing or body composition testing in a, an office or a space you've never used for before, you're going to fumble for where is the equipment, where is the form you need. And that, remember, puts doubt in her mind that you know what you're doing and makes her wonder if you lack experience. And so you've got to be sure that you're in that spot with each one of them. Teaching a specific piece of equipment like TRX or kettlebells, smaller pieces of equipment like that, equally important that you know the details. And that stands true when it's evidence that you're an expert if you can answer the questions before a customer knows what to ask. If you can give a tip about where to place your heels or ankles in a bridge when you have your legs up on a ball, and you can tell them where to put their hands, where not to put their hands, and how to use them before they think to ask, that sets you apart, makes you distinct. And quite often, you'll see a new trainer not know to do that. And that's just a matter of practice. So practicing with someone who's more experienced can really help you get to the edge. Looking at, you know, students flock to classes like Les Mills or um, body training systems. So we're talking about maybe body pump or talking about, you know, step power or group ride. Those types of canned programs that in the last 10 to 15 years came back because we had too much broad continuum of standard among fitness instructors, you know, and people notoriously would call the front desk and say, who's teaching? Who's teaching at four o'clock today? Who's teaching at 530 today? And the phone was ringing needlessly, you know, wasting phone space, you know, for those customers or prospects who might be calling in to book their appointment. And it took a lot of customer service. So the challenge was, you know, if you had, if you lost a great instructor, you were really in trouble for a little while because attendance would go down. And so it's important to have that standard. And when we brought in these, you know, here's the workout, Every instructor goes through and trains on how to deliver that standard workout, then the customer has a better experience. So very similarly, we're seeing this in you know, not just Les Mills or Body Training Systems, actually, who was bought by Les Mills, or we're seeing it in bar fitness classes, right? Or hot yoga, when it's actually Bikram hot yoga, according to a certain 26 poses done twice, all the way through, everything is consistent. From one instructor to the next, it doesn't matter. If you show up for that class and that title, you have the expectation that it's going to be high quality and fairly predictable and be familiar to you. That gives the trainer, the instructor, an edge. So you want to not necessarily can it because with every individual client, 
your delivery is going to be slightly different. That's why it's personal, right? It's why it's custom. However, you know, look at the fact that students flock to those classes because it's no longer because of the instructor, but because the format's predictable. And the instructors are taught, they rehearse, and they're confident in the class and their delivery. The music is set up to help the instructor, help the students succeed, and suddenly your part-time instructors with little or no background in exercise can be confident and deliver consistent, congruent classes across the board. So you want to, as a personal trainer, take that knowledge and use it. How can you consistently deliver high quality standard even though you're going to have some variability from client to client? So you've got to practice those things that you do every day. It has to be a system. You're going to do a body composition and a movement assessment on everyone. So make sure you get good at that so that it's comfortable and it's smooth and you are relaxed when you do it because they can sense that. Make sure that you understand how you interpret a fitness test and results so that you are persuading them to take the next step. That takes practice. Make sure that you are an expert in assessing where are they. They're where they have a problem. They're where there is a solution. They're where that you're the solution. That's a different conversation, three different conversations, so that you can move them along to the next space. And then the last one, which is buying, right? So important that you're looking at that. And in this podcast, within it, to develop the content, I've used three resources. So if you're interested and you are like bottom line analytical and you want to read the primary research yourself, you can visit fitnessmarketingmastery.com forward slash podcast for the episode today and get a better handle on what's happening. So if you have a question, please leave it below the show at fitnessmarketingmastery.com forward slash podcast. And for the links and the resources or references used today, you know where to go. And if you're a trainer who wants to make a difference, reach more people, join our community where I share the juiciest tips and the trends only with my subscribers. Until next time on the Voice for Fitness Professionals podcast.